I work with a lot of young people in schools teaching poetry. Um, part of the aim is to help inculcate and introduce a style of writing and, and empowerment through language that gives them the ability to articulate their own experience, be it cultural, uh, be it political, in a way that they feel is conducive uh, to saying what it is that they want to say without the alienation of being coming from a working class background, a, bra a black or brown background. That's part of my main focus. So I've written uh, two poems that look at Eurocentric uh, education and the way in which we're taught history um, through a very inaccurate uh, paradigm that needs to be readjusted in my opinion. So the first poem is called The Master's Revenge. There will be revenge but it will be different from yours. It won't involve blood or murder or deception. It won't turn sophisticated people to rubble, then call them underdeveloped, primitive and backwards. It won't need military budgets, fear, prejudice or gender repression. It will be simple, uncomfortable and absolute. It will present itself calmly. There will be no screams. There will be no protests. Just this. You are the owner of all energy needed to destroy or create worlds. Within you lies the peace of Akhenaten, the vision of Imhotep. We can go further, the first messiah. You are the writer of knowledge, the keeper of truth. It's looking at you through the stones, in the history of the mountains and the DNA of the earth. You're there. This wicked narrative is new. It's evil and unwell. A thousand years ago, you were teaching them. They were lost, barbaric, never knowing the evolution of language, of culture, the influence you had, you still have, you must have, because you're far from dead. Listen to the speakers. The knowers, the ones who tell you to open pages and find yourself there. Reinvent the past, pay the oppressor little mind. Little mind fears genius because it knows your story. It knows about the old kingdoms in the middle periods, from Moorish Spain to Muslim medicine. It knows about African mathematicians and the stone calendar circles of an apt supplier. It knows, that's why it denies, that's why it tells you to kill yourself. Death has many faces. If something is made ill, why swallow it? Don't accept it, renounce it and go back to before the chattel, the division and genocide before the white Jesus, before the crusades and the foreign religions that came with priests and swords, discover the hidden world, because history is self-serving, self-fulfilling, look in the prisons, look in the armies, look in the places filled with the broken, the destitute, the trampled on, the us but not them, look and see what happens when you become apathetic, when you believe the story they tell you, when revenge is just for radicals, when your only weapon is a gun, when your only hope is a fantasy, when your knowledge is obsolete, when your woman is a bitch, when your brother is a threat, and your oppressor is your master, your standard, your ideal, Don't don't ask for mercy, it won't be given, leave it, lock it off, leave it there, it's dead, it's done the damage, consecrated the sickness, it doesn't work. So start again with just this. When they ask you for a beginning, teach them about the Grimaldi, about Menes and the First Dynasty. When they ask you about women, speak to them of Isis, of Hatshepsut and Cleopatra. When they ask you about European languages, refer them to Coptic and Western Semitic tongues. Explain how 50% of the Greek lexicon is comprised of a non-Indo-European language. Give examples. When they ridicule you for saying in it, claiming the word as being Jamaican patois, let them know that it's a contraction of isn't it, which is a contraction of is it not, which is English and not patois, is it not. When I ask you about war and peace, inform them that the word war comes from the old English where, meaning to bring into confusion, mention the golden age of Egypt, communicate the fact that civilizations which have experienced the greatest periods of peace have been matriarchal. Say that twice. Include the fact that 70% of Native Americans did not ever wage war with each other. Refer them to conquest, sexual violence and American Indian genocide by Andrea Smith. Keep close to mind the Haitian Revolution to St. Levitore and Dessaline. If they interject, calling you Afrocentric or a conspiracy theorist, reply with these names. Volney, Gerald Massey, Martin Bunau, Bouval and Brophy continue. Discuss human nature, how we remain products of our environment, how we mirror what we see, how certain genes are activated or deactivated in in our childhood determining who we become later. Explain what you mean by white supremacy as a political tool to divide and undermine those who don't fit the aesthetic. Discuss Thomas Spence and the making of the English working class. Look at degenerate families in the US and Anthony Stokes. Speak of Palestine with courage. Declare that before the 15th of May 1948 
Zionists had already expelled 250,000 Palestinians, emphasised that people are not born bad, that before capitalism and feudalism, communalism was how we lived, not primitive but equal. Do not negate your woman. There is more to feminism than her physical appearance. You may wish to talk about Simone de Beauvoir, Bell Hooks and Angela Davis, and then poetry. The spoken word that predates the written word, oral tradition, art and storytelling. Speak until the sun has risen and set a thousand times. Where the crown doesn't need a stolen jewel to shine, assure them that you are made from love. That you speak from love because that is from where you were born. Play them a song, read them a haiku, teach them how to dance. Many will laugh at you, many will brand you insane. Yet when has madness ever really mattered here? Some will listen and some will stay. And you will grow into friends, into solidarity, into the forever we dream about. So treasure your woman. Treasure your man. Because we're all we have. Peace is the master's revenge. So stand in the present. Draw for the future. And shoot with all the ammunition of the past. So uh, this is last poem is a direct response to people who try and define poetry as being for a particular group of people um, who owns it and who doesn't own it. This is not a poem and I am not a poet. When I'm unable to find a better way of saying that in 2012 48 people in Great Britain were killed by guns and 120 women killed by the hands of their beloved partners. I am not a poet when I can't find a more beautiful way to say that no nation in the world imprisons as many members of its population as America does. The more black men in the US are incarcerated today than what they were during the peak of South Africa's apartheid. No, I am not a poet when I can't find clever words to illustrate the fact that before 2008, Nelson Mandela had been on America's list of most dangerous terrorists for over 60 years, that Cameron is a liar, that Cameron was a key member of the Foundation of Conservative Students in 18 that hope to hang Mandela. Forgive me because today I am not a poet and this is not a poem. When eloquent words fail me and I can't capture the struggle of the poor through the metaphysics of language, that by the time Margaret Thatcher left office in 1990, the annual incomes of the richest 0.01% of British society had climbed to 70 times the national mean. And I don't know how I feel about the fact that key policy makers and leading civil servants have never had a job outside of their politics. The same men who set the minimum wage with only 4% ever having worked in manual trades of which 68% went to private schools. That is why this is not a poem and I am not a poet. Because everything I've ever written suffers the weight of its own futility when another mother comes to a workshop with a fresh black eye. When there's another empty seat in the place that James sat in last week and when I asked the group where he is their young eyes open wet as if his coffin in that moment was being lowered into them but you see I can understand all this more when they cut funding to schemes that aimed at inspiring people previously inspired by crime and the insufferable dross of mainstream culture private prison systems and prisons for profit when young women are given more options than just be someone's girl be someone's mother be someone's silence but you see I've done it again I've crossed themes I've not followed traditional poetic form and so I'm a terrible poet because how do I speak words in prison and then tell a young black person that they were once kings and queens of lands whose names fall dead on their tongue? How do I return their history? How do I mention the Marriott excavation, Chicanta Diop and the skin cell sampling of 300 mummies? How do I show them pictures of skyscrapers before skyscrapers even existed? How do I do all this and then have them ask what part of the world I am from? Why well, don't write poetry about 1974, Eoga and Kissinger until I tell them that I am not a poet and nothing I can write will help dismantle this idea of race that we've become so attached to. Nothing I can write will include the importance of mitochondrial DNA and the 99.99% of us that is identical. That a BMP member most probably has more Asian and Arab in them than the mosque that they conspire to blow up. That immigration isn't a choice. That people don't come to the UK for great weather, hospitality and quality of life. How do I explain all this and still retain artistic merit? I spent days looking for a metaphor to put the Palestinian Nakba in until I found a home that once stood beautiful and prim and then I opened the door and saw its contents ransacked, its family massacred and its garden on fire. 
From that day, I abandoned any hope of metaphor and accepted that I could not write poetry about this, that everything I tried to imagine had already slit its own stomach, like the afternoon I spent with a woman who had been raped. I asked her to capture it in verse, I asked her to use simile and alliteration until she looked at me and said, I don't know what those things mean, but I can tell you in a few simple words what it feels like to live with the Satan of your own heart. Poetry isn't for me. It's for people who can use words like odoriferous while putting red wine to the lips of their white skin and applaud the technical endeavour of a poem. It's wit, it's ingenuity, it's metre and form, not it's helping, not the ambulant siren that screeches from the height of its title. That is why this is not a poem and I am not a poet. Because I cried reading Douglas Dunn, Aaron Kalatka, Borges and Neruda. I cried when I went looking for female poets and found few. I cried when asked how many black poets Penguin had ever published and was told two. When my English teacher told me that language wasn't my strength, that my anger crushed my intelligence, that I should think about going and learning a trade and I cried then too when I spoke to a group of young men about what it was to be a man, how we inherit this cancerous culture, how we inherit misogyny, objectification and the glory of violence while silently suppressing the sensual. These were all the hardest things to talk about, to write about and to live with. That is why I keep saying that this is not a poem. And I am not a poet. Because all of the above digress and ignore the rules set by the establishment. But all that doesn't matter. Because it's done now. You've come this far in listening. Endings are always the hardest thing to write. Because the author knows that's the last impression the reader will be left with. And so I chose the following wisely. We are made up of all the things that broke us just to keep us alive. Maybe I could have said just that. But I didn't, because like I said, this is not a poem, and I am not a poet. Thank you. Thank you very much.